Hello, I'm Glenn Hall. Today is April 3rd, 2023. This video is called God's Last Six Plagues. I'm going to continue reading from a prophecy that God gave to Leland Earls. I'm not sure of the exact date. I think it was in the either the late 1960s or the early 1970s. <clears throat> and I published, um, I think it was my second to last video, the first four plagues. I'm not going to comment, I'm not planning to comment much, if any, on this, uh, but I want to give a little bit of an introduction. I believe that uh, God did prophetically speak through Leland Earls, and that he has done that through various men uh, throughout history. And it's very interesting, um, in the prophecy that he gave, that God gave to Leland Earls, he often uses the word type and anti-type. <clears throat> I use the word parables, and I want to read a um, scripture to you. It's from Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. He said, this is God speaking, of course, I spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied visions and through the prophets gave parables. In the book of Mark and the book of Matthew, it says that Jesus always used parables when he taught people. And privately, he would explain the parables to his disciples. If you want to understand the Word of God, you have to go to Jesus privately and ask him to explain to you. Otherwise, you will never, ever understand the Word of God. And the reason is this. Since Jesus always taught in parables, that means that he also wrote the Bible through men in parables. So even though the Bible is historically accurate and true, they are historical accounts of events that really happened, he gave the information to his prophets to write in parables so that that's why the scripture is the way it is it it's very well it's impossible to understand you, you can't understand it no one can unless god reveals it to them it's and that's why that's why you need to spend yourself That's why you need to give all to understand God and understand his word. Again, in Hosea, he said, I spoke to the prophets. I, God, spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied visions and through the prophets gave parables. So now we're going to continue reading from Leland Earle's prophecy that God gave him. And we're on the fifth plague. And I will put a link to this uh, and the information to this video. The fifth plague. The refusal of Pharaoh to let the people go resulted in the coming of a fifth plague on Egypt. Now, you have to go to the book of um, Exodus, of course, to read about Moses and Pharaoh and all the plagues. This plague was not directly upon man, but upon his animals, according to Exodus 9, verse 3. In those days of a largely agrarian society, A man's land and his animals were the essence of his wealth. 
men were dependent on animals, not only for food, but for most basic work needs and for commerce and transportation. Thus, the destruction of the livestock of Egypt was a crippling blow to the economy of the land. This is symbolic. In other words, it's a parable, says the Lord, of that which shall come on the nations in the end time. The monetary wealth of all nations will largely be destroyed. What do we see happening right now? You've been hearing about runs on banks and things like that? Been hearing about moving to a uh, digital currency? This is symbolic, says the Lord, of that which shall come on the nations in the end time. The monetary wealth of all nations will largely be destroyed. This will come through the collapse of the Babylonian system of finance, which has a stranglehold on most nations. Its practice of debt and interest money will cause prices and wages to continue to spiral. The inflation that we've seen since Leland Earls wrote this is astronomical. When he wrote this, for example, you could often buy gas for 19 cents a gallon. When wages have reached the point where further increases will be stymied, inflation will continue to eat away buying power until it will take most of what the average person makes to provide the basic necessities of life. The eventual weight of debt and interest will be so great that the entire system will collapse. Money, which most people consider to be wealth, will be practically worthless. Accumulated wealth through savings and investments will mean nothing. Control and rationing will become absolutely necessary. Freedom to buy and sell will be virtually wiped out. Government control of everything will become mandatory for survival. People's lives will be regulated through tabulated work credits and assigned consumer allotments. Have you heard of the credit score you get in China? You can't buy or sell unless you, your credit score is such and such. Money will be replaced by a number system. Electronic equipment will keep track of each family's work, contribution, or credits, and the amount of goods and services needed and provided. Now, when you consider when he wrote this, 1960s or early 70s, you did not have personal computers. You did not even have the Apple, the first Apple yet. That came out, in, I believe, around 1977. All businesses will be controlled by the government, and those who refuse to comply with all regulations will not be able to buy raw materials or sell their products. See Revelation 13, verse 17. This is dealing with the mark of the beast. No business will be allowed to sell to customers as is now practiced. All goods and services will be government controlled. Distribution will be on the basis of need, and such need will be determined by statistical factors required from each family. Credits will be granted based on work contribution and family need. Special requisition papers will be necessary for purchases other than daily needs. These extreme measures will be required because of the critical world situation. But the basic framework of a controlled society will be the result of years of planning and scheming by an intellectual caste which dominates the thinking of the higher echelons of government personnel. Have you heard of World, uh, World Economic Forum? Klaus Schwab? See, that's what this is referring to. They have been scheming and planning this for decades and decades. You will notice, says the Lord, that the plague was on the animals or wealth of the Egyptians, but not on the Israelites, according to Exodus 9, verses 4 through 6. Now, what is the symbolic meaning of this? What is the true wealth of a born-again child of God? 
Is it material or spiritual? Is it not written that you are made rich in Christ? According to 2 Corinthians 8, 9 and Revelation 2, 9, can the failure of man and his systems take away the treasures which you have laid up in heaven? According to Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. I say to you that the reality of my presence and power among my people in that day will be so great that they will not be greatly affected by the wiping out of accumulated monetary wealth. Their joy and affection and hope will be so centered on me and my glory shall be so great upon them that they will take little interest in that which is strictly material. Their true wealth will remain unaffected by the vicissitudes of man's fluctuating economy. Whatever temporary inconveniences they will suffer will be more than made up for by the exceeding great spiritual wealth which will be theirs at that time. For my people will have begun to press into their full inheritance, even the kingdom blessings and powers prepared for them from the foundation of the world. There is a correlation between the fact that the animals of Egypt were destroyed and the fact that complete economic control will deprive man of the exercise of the basic drives of acquisition and gain. Animals are a type of the basic propensities and drives of the carnal human nature. In other words, animals are a parable that speak prophetically of our human nature. Birds of the air are a type of the thoughts of the mind. Fish in the sea are a type of the emotions and feelings. And beasts are a type of native talents, animalistic drives, and carnal avarice. It is this inner world of human nature which man has failed to gain dominion over that is causing all of the chaotic conditions among peoples and nations. The present mania of those who are working for a controlled society is based on the false notion that man can be reformed if he is deprived of the opportunity to exercise and give vent to mental, emotional, and volitional tendencies which corrupt society. Since man will not control himself, he must be controlled in every avenue of life and be gradually immunized to his former corrupt self, so the argument goes. This means an all-powerful government by self-appointed guardians of the masses of people. Who is supposed to control and immunize those in authority is problematical. Such is the bankrupt thinking of men who have turned from God to the delusion of their own ways. The macrocosm of man's outer world can abound in goodness and peace only as the microcosm or inner world of man's thoughts, emotions, and drives are completely subdued and channeled unto the glory of his God. Thus the problem is spiritual, and not economic, political, or social. Only as men are regenerated within can they gain dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the beasts of the earth within their own microcosm. This is man's first and primary task, set before him at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26-28. to 28. Think not that the Lord your God was concerned with man's gaining dominion over the outer world. This was but an allegory, or a parable, to portray the inner world of man's being and the necessity of gaining dominion over every thought, emotion, desire, ability, propensity, and drive until all resources and forces within reflect the beauty and glory of God above. The gaining of dominion over the outer world is secondary and is contingent on the gaining of dominion over the inner, the inner man. Those who have gained a commendable measure of dominion over this, their inner being through the grace and power of their God will be given an inheritance and authority over the outer world of the earth and all of its inhabitants, being commissioned to rule and reign with Christ. Let me read that again, because this is very important, and this is one of the things that I continue to teach about. And it's, it's one of the things dealing with repentance. You have to become aware of your sin, and you have to repent and determine not to do it again. 
those who have gained a commendable measure of dominion over their inner being through the grace and power of their God will be given an inheritance and authority over the outer world of the earth and all of its inhabitants, being commissioned to rule and reign with Christ. But they cannot rule with Christ over that which is outer until they have gained dominion over the inner realm of their own mind and heart. The sixth plague. Let us now continue, says the Lord, to behold the plagues which fell on Egypt, and let me reveal to you this, their latter-day counterpart. After Pharaoh hardened his heart again, refusing to let the people go, a sixth plague became necessary. It was on both man and animals in the form of open sores breaking out, according to Exodus 9, verse 9. Moses was commanded to take ashes from a furnace and sprinkle the fine particles toward heaven. This was done before or in the presence of Pharaoh in Exodus 9, verses 8 to 10. Now what does this mean, says the Lord? Is not Satan, who is typified by Pharaoh, the prince of the powers of the air, according to Ephesians 2, verse 2, so does this signify the power of Satan to cause men to unleash the firepower of the atom which affects or pollutes the air. What have we been hearing lately about uh, Ukraine and Russia? All this talk about nuclear war now, you know, used to be anathema to, to even think about nuclear war, but now, oh, it's in the news. And when you start hearing about these things in the news, what usually happens. It happens. So, God says that this plague signifies the power of Satan to cause men to unleash the firepower of the atom which affects or pollutes the air. This is shown by the fact that the residue of that which had been burned by fire, ashes, was sprinkled into the air, thus symbolically contaminating the air. The result was the breaking forth of sores on man and beast. Thus is portrayed the effects of radiation in a parable. By the time this plague begins to fall, men will have begun the increasing use of tactical atomic weapons in mounting warfare. The result will be the increased pollution of the air and its effects on all living flesh. All that is, except those who are especially protected by the mighty power of their God. These, like the ones protected in the land of Goshen, will not feel the burning power of radiation-contaminated air. The effect of this plague was to further harden the heart of Pharaoh. Even the frightening prospect of atomic pollution will not turn the nations from the mad pursuit of their own ends. In time, the nations will be engaged in the final battle of the ages, symbolically termed Armageddon in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 16. The plagues which follow will unfold very rapidly as the tempo of conflict increases. You will note also that the magicians of Egypt could not stand before Moses because they too were afflicted with the sores. Exodus 9, 11. This indicates that the wise men of the end time will not be able to controvert the fact that there are those symbolized by Moses who are not being affected by the plague of radiation, but that they have a built-in immunity. For in that day, the Moses company will be the manifested sons of God who are no longer subject to death. All true Christians will also be protected, but they will not be naturally immune. The seventh plague. The rapidity with which events take place and the stepped-up tempo of judgment is seen in the words which Moses was commanded to speak to Pharaoh just before the final four plagues began to unfold. Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, 
that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues on your heart and on your servants and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite you and your people with pestilence and you shall be cut off from the earth. Exodus 9, 13 through 15. The next plague which followed, being the seventh, was that of a great storm consisting of thunder, lightning, and a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now according to Exodus 9, 18 and 23 through 24. The storm is symbolic of the worldwide storm of conflict, which will be gathering momentum in the earth. Several years ago, God gave prophet John Paul Jackson uh, words concerning the perfect storm. Increased use of atomic weapons will cause large amounts of water to be vaporized, ascending into the cold heights above to be frozen into large hailstones. These will then descend upon the earth, creating much destruction. Again, you will notice that those in the land of Goshen were protected from the hail. Exodus 9, verse 26. So shall I keep from all harm those that put their full trust in me. Even among the Egyptians, there was a measure of protection for those who heeded the word of God, according to Exodus 9, verses 19 and 20. This shows that as the end-time conflict increases in intensity, more and more people of the world will begin to listen to the word being preached by my chosen servants, and they will look to me for protection, and I will faithfully keep them to the measure of their trust and obedience. For at times my chosen servants will warn of severe destruction coming on certain places and certain cities. Those who heed my word and do what I tell them shall be preserved. You will notice further that the storm of the seventh plague is spoken of as, quote, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Close quote. That's Exodus 9 verse 18. Since Egypt is a type of the world, the statement becomes synonymous with the prophecy of Jesus concerning the end time tribulation period, where he said in Matthew 24, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Thus you can see that the tribulation period will have begun by the time this plague begins to be fulfilled. Like a storm, it will begin gradually and increase in intensity as the tribulation period progresses. The destruction of this plague, which was upon man and beast and vegetation, will not only have its counterpart in literal hail, which will fall, as previously explained, causing much destruction, but also much life will be lost as a result of the intensified conflict which this plague typifies. Because of the timing of this plague, it is recorded that the flax and the barley were smitten, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was bold. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. Exodus 9, 31 and 32. Now what does this mean, says the Lord? It indicates the progressive stages of the harvest of your God during the tribulation period. You will notice that the barley was already heading and the flax was not far behind. But the wheat and rye were not sufficient, sufficiently up to be affected. Barley is the first grain to ripen in the spring and is therefore a type of the first fruits of my harvest. Those who enter more fully into my purposes and come to spiritual maturity before the rest. The fact that the flax was just beginning to bloom indicates that the first fruits will have the fruit of righteousness, according to Philippians 1.10, 1.11 and Hebrews 12:11 fulfilled in them in preparation for the marriage supper of the lamb for flax is that from which linen is made and fine linen is the righteousness of the saints according to revelation 19 verse 8 which is where you see the wedding of the bride and the lamb the first fruits spoken of here are those who will have begun to ripen before the tribulation period begins out of which a sheaf is taken and glorified, as described in the section on the fourth plague. 
be sure to read that section again. Go over that again. The fourth plague is when the Kodeshim, the 144,000, are glorified. They're going to be the protection, the mountains, for the other faithful Christians that still remain during these plagues. The fact that the barley and flax were smitten during this plague indicates that the more advanced and mature Christians are the ones who will take the brunt of the persecution, which will be an integral part of the intensified conflict of the time. The wheat and the rye, on the other hand, represent those Christians who will not be so severely persecuted because, as a whole, they will not be out in the forefront of the struggle. The storm of conflict represented by this plague will not only be political and military, but also spiritual and religious. The spiritual and religious factors taking on increasing importance as the struggle intensifies. For the final conflict of the ages is not just the result of predatory actions of certain nations. It is the consummation of the age-long struggle for the minds and allegiance of men. It is primarily ideological and spiritual. The wheat and the rye represent those Christians who have matured very little previous to the Great Tribulation, or those who are converted during the Tribulation, for there will be multitudes who will turn to their God in that day. The Egyptian grain, termed rye in the King James Version, is not the same as that which is called rye in this day. The Egyptian grain was more like wheat, but of an inferior quality. It was hard to be cleaned of its chaff. It thus becomes a type of the thirtyfold Christian, those who will be preserved by my almighty power through the tribulation to continue to live on the earth, but not within the confines of the kingdom realm. The wheat represents those who will be in the sixtyfold and hundredfold categories. And are slated to be fully gathered into the barn of the kingdom, according to Matthew 13, verse 30. They will mature under the harvest conditions of the tribulation period. The degree of progress made and the maturity realized will determine their category and their allotment. The 100-fold weak Christians will be translated and glorified at the close of the tribulation and gathered into the heavenly kingdom. And the 60-fold Christians will remain on the earth to be gathered into the earthly kingdom, eventually entering into immortality in human flesh. Since the barley Christians reach a commendable measure of maturity or ripeness even before the tribulation begins, they will all be 100-fold to enter into the heavenly kingdom. A sheaf at the beginning of the tribulation and the rest at the close of the tribulation. In my last video, I talked about the hidden feast, which is the second Passover. And uh, the sheaf, this is speaking of the wave offering. And um, the wave offering that is presented uh, on the day after the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the second Passover, I believe, is the time when this will be fulfilled according to the typology and the parable of the second Passover, as it was revealed to Moses in the book of Numbers. As a result of the seventh plague, Pharaoh was moved to relent. He called for Moses and Aaron and asked them to entreat the Lord to remove the mighty thunderings and hail, and he promised to let the people go. In Exodus 9, verses 27 and 28. But Moses was not fooled by his feigned change of heart, and he predicted that he, quote, feared not the Lord God, but sinned yet more and hardened his heart. We see in Exodus 9, verse 34. Thus will it be with many of the, wor many of the world during the intense pressures of the tribulation period. Because of the seriousness of the world situation and increasing chaotic conditions in many places, many will turn with feigned heart unto the Lord and seek out his servants to pray for them. But once there seems to be a way out of their predicament and pressures seem to lighten a little, they will sin yet the more. 
and harden their hearts. My true servants, however, will not be deceived by those who are not truly repentant. The power of my spirit will be working so mightily among my people that the unclean and uncircumcised will not go undetected. Neither will they enter to contaminate the assemblies of the saints. According to Isaiah 52 verse 1. Those who are sincere will be welcomed and helped, but those whose motives are tainted with corrupt designs will be discerned and exposed. The pretenders will not be allowed to remain and sow their seeds of mischief. I will have a pure work, says the Lord, and that which is of the enemy will not be allowed to take root. It will be quickly dealt with by those who are the true shepherds of my people. During the earlier plagues, it is said that Pharaoh hardened his heart, or that his heart was hardened, But during the latter plagues, it is said that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. See Exodus 9, 12, 10, 1, uh, 10, 10 through 20, and 10, 27. What's the meaning of this, says the Lord? Is it not written that in the day of evil's consummation, I will send a strong delusion on those who love not the truth, that they should believe a lie? See 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. Now why, says the Lord, will I do this, and in what way am I justified? I am justified in doing so because I am able to know the point at which an unrepentant sinner will under no foreseeable circumstances turn from his evil ways. I will do so in order to more quickly bring about an impasse, that the catastrophic struggle which shall sweep away humanity's refuge of lies be not prolonged. By causing men to be more thoroughly deluded in their ways, which they are convinced they should follow, I am able to get them to more quickly set in motion those forces and courses of action which will precipitate the world into judgment. I am also thereby able to more profoundly show my mighty hand of deliverance to those who put their trust in me. For those who are hardened to do evil must be dealt with more severely. And thus the conflagration and whirlwind to judgment become so great that none can survive except those who are protected by me. The impact of such a worldwide reckoning with the sinful ways of man will long be remembered and told to succeeding generations and will be a strong deterrent to any future deviation from the paths of righteousness. See Exodus 10, verse 2. The eighth plague. I believe I'm going to stop this one here at at this point because this has been uh, over 30 minutes and I will probably have some comments in the next section that I'll I'll want to spend a little bit of time with. So, Father, I pray that we would heed the words that you've spoken spoken through your prophet, Leland Earls. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for your protection and believe that you will protect us in the coming plagues. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.